is our fourth week in the book of First Peter, and today we will be in chapter four. Now, right off the bat, I want to tell you exactly what my entire message is all about in just one word. You know, later this week, if someone asks you, hey, what did you learn about in church? That'll be a really easy question for you to answer. You'll say, well, I learned about, and give them the one word. But before I tell you what that one word is, I need you to promise me that once I do tell you, you won't turn me out for the rest of the time or maybe even stop watching altogether. Like seriously though, I I want you to promise me that right now. Like say it out loud wherever you're at, type it in the chat. Okay, Becky, I'm sticking with you. Got it? Okay. The one thing we're gonna spend our time together focused on today is self-denial. Now, I know not the most positive, encouraging, hope-filled word in the English language. If uh, you're joining in looking for that feel-good sermon, like, probably won't be it. But you promised you'd stay with me. So, you know, all kidding aside, self-denial, it's a challenging topic to sit with, especially as Americans because our culture doesn't really place any value on exhibiting this quality in one's life. In fact, it's pretty much the opposite. We live in an individualistic culture where we desire self-fulfillment, not self-denial. We prescribe value to living life in a way that makes us happy and successful. The bottom line is that my rights My prerogatives, my desires come first. And when we combine this with our obsession for instant gratification, I mean, the idea of denying gratification or at the very least delaying it, it's just foreign and unappealing. But this is exactly why it's so important. We lean in together today because what Peter is going to show us is that self-denial isn't just a quality to be admired in a culture that's focused on self, but it's a defining characteristic to be exemplified in the life of anyone who claims to follow Jesus. So grab your Bible or open your Bible app and turn with me to 1 Peter. We're in chapter four and we're going to take a look at just the first three verses today. Let's take a few moments to read those Together, the Apostle Peter writes, Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you've spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. Okay, so let's break this down bit by bit. Peter starts this section with the word right there in the very beginning, therefore. And we've talked about this before, that whenever we see that word phrase, we should immediately ask ourselves, what is the therefore, therefore? I know, super cheesy, but super helpful to remember. Because typically, whenever we see the word therefore in scripture, its purpose is to reorient something. It's emphasizing that there's something that Christ has done or achieved. There's something about who God is or what he's done that should then in turn shape or structure or move us into a way of being or doing. We saw this in what Pastor Steve and Pastor Christian unpacked last week from chapter one, where Peter says, hey, because of God's mercy and the new life and hope that he's given us through Jesus, because of who God is and what he's done, therefore, our response is to be alert and of sober mind, to set our hope fully in Jesus. Something about who God is and what he's done that guides us into who we are or what we do as God's people. And this is true here in 1 Peter 4 as well. So what is it that God has done? Well, look back at verse 1. Peter says that Christ suffered in his body. 
He's actually referring back to chapter three, where he says, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. Why? To bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. Christ suffered in his body. Therefore, here's what we should do. Here's how we should live. As a result, Peter says, therefore, arm yourselves also with the same attitude. Okay, that word arm here in the Greek, it's a military term. It means to make ready or to equip. It's referring to putting on like heavy armor, like battle worthy armor. The Greek tense for this word arm, it it actually calls for a specific, definite, decisive choice. So when Peter is saying, arm yourselves, he's saying, do this exact thing right now, like this is top priority. You see here, Peter, he's calling us, really, he's commanding us to reflect Jesus by thinking like Jesus. Because Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude. That begs the question, what was Jesus's attitude in the midst of suffering? Well, we know from reading through scripture that Jesus suffered in many ways throughout his life. He suffered socially. He was despised and rejected, even lonely at times. Jesus suffered emotionally, experiencing betrayal, fear, anxiety, being hated. But here in chapter four, Peter is speaking specifically about Jesus's physical suffering. What was the pinnacle of physical suffering that Jesus endured in his lifetime? Yeah, the cross. So what was Jesus's attitude as he looked toward the cross? Well, we find the answer in Matthew 26. This is the night before Jesus's death on the cross. He just finished having the Passover meal with his disciples. And it's at that meal where he washes their feet. He, he serves them the first communion. He, he shared wisdom and encouragement and challenge with them, knowing that this was his final opportunity to coach them, to disciple them before his impending death. Then Jesus takes his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane in order to pray. Jesus knows that Judas has already left to betray him. It won't be much longer before the religious leaders come for him. And it's in this moment that Jesus is burdened by the weight of knowing that he's about to be arrested, wrongfully condemned, beaten, flogged, given a crown of thorns and crucified the next day where he will hang to death from a cross bearing the full weight of God's wrath for all of sinful humanity. And it's in this moment that Jesus is alone in the garden and he's crying out to God. He's so overwhelmed that he's literally sweating drops of blood and he prays the same prayer three different times. He prays, Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me. If it's possible, remove this suffering from me. It's too much. I can't bear it. If there is any other way, please take it from me. You know, I think sometimes we imagine that because Jesus is God, that the cross was easy for him. I think sometimes we think that because he knew the resurrection and the redemption that was on the other side of it, that Jesus was in a way looking forward to the cross. Yes, Jesus was fully God, but we can't forget that he was also fully man. A man who experienced the complete spectrum 
of human emotions in this moment in the garden, Jesus is making it so deliberately, unmistakably clear that this was not what he, in his humanness, wanted to do. Yet each time, Jesus ends his prayer in the same way. He says, yet not as I will, but as you will. Yet not as I will, but as you will. What was the attitude Jesus had when he faced suffering that Peter is calling us to arm ourselves with as well? It's an attitude of self-denial. Think about it. Before his physical body ever experienced death, Jesus had already chosen to die to self. He had already chosen to surrender his wants, his desires, for his father's wants and desires. The Apostle Paul describes it like this in his letter to the church in Philippi, where he says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. I think about that. If anyone had the right to use their power and privilege for their own glory, their own advancement, it was Jesus. I mean, surely if there was anyone who had the prerogative to live life driven by and focused on their own needs and desires, it was Jesus. But instead of using his divinity to his own advantage, Paul says, rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. Or you could say he denied himself by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross. What was the mindset, the attitude Jesus had? It was one of self-denial, not as I will, but as you will. Do you ever think about how the gospel writers knew about this moment in the garden? Like when Jesus is crying out in anguish to God, it's such a raw and intimate moment. But Matthew, Mark, Luke, they all give an account in their gospel books of Jesus' prayer in the garden. But how did they know? I mean, it's not like they spied on Jesus and overheard things. No, we know the disciples, they were all sleeping in the garden in that moment. How did they know? Jesus had to tell them. Think about that. Jesus dies on the cross, is raised to life three days later, and then he spends 40 days with his disciples before ascending into heaven. And at some point in those 40 days, was it day one or day 39? I don't know. But at some point, Jesus is with his disciples. Maybe they're gathered around a table sharing a meal together. And he says, do you want to know what I was praying about in the garden? the night before I was crucified. I can, I can imagine all of the disciples saying like, yes, oh my gosh, yes, I want to know. The room falls quiet, right? They're all leaning in, sitting on the edge of their seats, eagerly awaiting what is Jesus about to say next? What is he going to reveal? I can imagine Jesus pausing looking around the room, maybe even locking eyes with Peter and saying, I prayed that God would take the cup from me. I prayed I wouldn't have to go through with it. It was too much for me to bear. It it was too much for me to carry. So I prayed, Father, if there's any other way. And then I said, yet not as I will, but as you will. 
I can imagine in that moment, the words that Jesus spoke to his disciples months, even years earlier, when he told them, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. I can imagine in that moment, those words are cemented into Peter's heart and his mind in a way that they had never taken root before. Because in that moment, Peter is realizing that the life Jesus is calling him to is literally the same self-denying, cross-carrying path that Jesus himself walked. I can imagine that it's those words that Peter is thinking about here in chapter four, when he writes, because of what Christ suffered and accomplished through the cross, anyone who wants to follow him must intentionally choose to arm themselves with the same attitude Christ had, an attitude of self-denial. But you see, it's not just an attitude of self-denial for the sake of self-denial. No, it's self-denial for the sake of obedience to God. It's surrendering my own will for the sake of being obedient to God's will. Look back at 1 Peter 4, verse 2. Peter provides his readers with two choices. He says, you can either live the rest of your earthly lives for human desires, or you can live that for the will of God. Those are your two choices. You can either take the path of least resistance going along with the values, norms, practices that are acceptable and expected by society, or you can choose to be obedient to God. You can choose to walk down the road of self-denial. You can choose to go against what you may want, what you may desire, go against your human passions and impulses for the sake of obedience. Man, obedience is a tricky thing, isn't it? I mean, our culture tells us that to be obedient is, is, it's like to be oppressed. We don't need people telling us what to do. Like, let's buck the system. We don't want to be obedient. In fact, we want the opposite. We want independence. We want the freedom to be able to do what it is that we want to do. To make our own rules. As a mom, I experience this truth almost daily. I have two boys. I've got a third boy on the way. And when they are first born, there is just, they're just like this amazing blob of cuteness and joy and barfing. But like, man, even their barf is cute. And then what happens? They get older and they begin to become mobile and they're curious, which is great but it means I have to provide them with some boundaries. I have to point out the things that they can't touch because it will either hurt them or they will hurt it. And I can remember so vividly the moment with each of my boys when they first chose to do the very thing I had told them not to do, right? They chose to disobey. It's so heartbreaking. And you all know, like, they don't just disobey, right? They pick up that thing that they aren't supposed to, and they're like, what? And I'm like, no, what happened to my cute baby? It's not in our nature to embrace obedience. That's why this is so incredible that Christ, he lives this out. A life devoted not to his own happiness or comfort, but to obedience. Step by step, by step, all the way to the cross. Peter's saying, hey, when we choose self-denial over self-preservation, when we choose to live life being driven by God's will instead of living life driven by our own will, then that's when we are truly following in Jesus's footsteps. That's how we know we're a disciple. You know, it's difficult as self-denial is, when we live life being driven by God's will instead of our own will, we won't simply experience like restrictions. No, we'll actually experience 
greater freedom. I mean, this is actually why Paul says in verse one that those who choose self-denial, they are done with sin. They're done with sin. He's not saying that they are perfect and they no longer sin. No, he's saying that the appeal of sin, the grip of sin, the power of sin no longer has a strong hold on us. When we practice self-denial, the grip of that thing that we're denying ourselves of, it no longer has such a strong hold on us. I mean, science only confirms this to be true. There's so much evidence that when we practice self-denial, let's say when it comes to things like the food we consume, those restrictions allow us to actually experience greater freedom, greater health, because we no longer are held so strongly by food. Practicing self-denial when it comes to the material possessions we want. Those restrictions of saying, no, I'm going to choose not to have this, not to upgrade to this, not to purchase that. It actually leads us to experiencing not less, but more contentment in life. You see, self-denial, it isn't just good for you later on in eternity. No, it's good for you now. So here's the question that I want all of us to spend a considerable amount of time this week thinking about. Do I choose self-denial? Do I arm myself with self-denial? Is, there, is the way in which I live out being a Christian marked by self-denial? Are there small ways and drastic ways in which my life reflects God, not my will, but your will. And what what does choosing self-denial even look like in the Bay Area of California in 2021? Well, look back at the list that Peter provides in the second half of verse three. He says debauchery, there's lust, drunkenness. These, there, there are some of us who struggle with these things. And I don't say that to shame anyone. I say that to just speak reality. For those of us who do struggle with these kinds of things, choosing self-denial, it may look like living a life of sexual purity. As impossible as that may seem in today's age, especially in a place like the Bay Area. Self-denial might mean having guardrails and accountability in place so that you don't continue to let pornography control your life. Self-denial might look like limiting the number of drinks you're going to have so that you don't simply numb the anxiety and the loneliness that you're feeling, but you actually sit with it. You allow the Holy Spirit to deal with it, to heal it. For others of us, maybe we can't relate to the things on this list. That isn't where we struggle with self-denial. Well, that doesn't mean we get a free pass. Look at the last thing Peter includes on this list. He says, and detestable idolatry. What's idolatry? It's simply anything in life that we ascribe higher worth or value to than God. I mean, that one, it just like blows the practical application of this wide open, right? What does self-denial look like when it comes to my pride or selfishness or, or my desire for advancement and recognition and success? What would choosing self-denial look like when it comes to my desire for materialism, for the latest and greatest, bigger and better? What would choosing self-denial look like when it comes to how I spend my money, how I serve my family, the words that I choose to speak to others? What would choosing self-denial look like when it comes to how I think about, interact with, and tangibly love those around me who are different than me, who think differently than me, 
who believe, who vote differently than me. You see, self-denial is where the rubber meets the road when it comes to our faith. The truth is following Jesus is about dying to ourselves so that Christ can be glorified through us. Following Jesus, it is so simple, but it is not easy. I know for me, I oftentimes attempt to rationalize things and and convince myself. I can make a pretty good argument as to why self-denial isn't really necessary in certain aspects of my life. For me, it's so easy to focus on the areas where I do practice self-denial well and let that excuse me from surrendering the other areas. I'm stubborn. I want control. I need control. And so oftentimes in the places where I need to embrace obedience, I fight it. I can't do it. I don't want to do it. And I know I'm not the only one who wrestles with this. Perhaps in those moments, we can come before God openly, honestly, just like Jesus did in the garden and say, Father, I know I need to choose self-denial. I know I need to be obedient to what you're asking of me, but I can't do it. I don't want to do it. If there's any other way, let's go with that way. Church, self-denial is so opposite of our human desires. It's so in conflict with our culture's values that it's not something we do by just trying really hard to do it. But I believe even that simple act of acknowledging to God the places where we don't want to choose self-denial. It begins to open the door for the Holy Spirit to help reposition our heart and shift our attitude to a place of surrender. Not my will, but Father, your will. And you know, the journey of self-denial, it becomes easier when we don't try to go it alone. I mean, this is why establishing a new workout pattern, it becomes way more successful when we have a partner to go to the gym with. It's why new eating habits become way more achievable when we have someone else who's making the same diet changes we are. This is exactly why Peter is talking about choosing self-denial, but it's in the context of Christian community because we need one another for support, for accountability. It's so freeing when we're in a group of people who, hey, when you tell them your worst moments, they're still there. And they're not just still there with you, next to you. They're encouraging you and they're helping you grow from that. Don't try to go it alone. I'll close with this. Ultimately, self-denial comes down to trust. Do I actually trust that God's way is better than my way? Do I actually trust that God's will is better than my will? Do I really believe that the one who created me knows what's best for me and wants what's best for me and is working out what's best for me? And as a mom, I don't create boundaries for my boys because I'm bored or power hungry. I don't deny them of certain things or or require them to do other things because I have a goal of making their lives miserable. Although I'm sure there will be times in their lives where they think that's my goal. But it's actually the opposite. I do those things because I love them. Because I want them to experience the best of life. 
a life that's filled with joy and fulfillment, with meaning and peace and contentment, not a life filled with pain and sorrow or regret. Church, when our heavenly father calls us to embrace self-denial, to live this lifestyle of obedience to him, it isn't to be a killjoy or because he's power hungry or he wants to make our lives miserable. It's the opposite. He wants us to choose obedience because he loves us and he wants us to experience the best of life a life that's filled with joy and fulfillment, with meaning and purpose, with peace and contentment and not a life defined by pain and sorrow or regret. And God knows how to help us experience that life. That life only comes through the process of self-denial. When we trust And we choose to say, Father, not my will, but your will. Because unlike us, God's will is not driven by our human wants and desires. The will of God is not simply focused on our present comfort or our immediate happiness. No, the will of God is focused on our eternal redemption on our full and complete restoration to all that God originally created and designed us to be. That is what God is after. That is what he's working towards. And we can begin to experience that true joy, that that true redemption, both now and for all of eternity. When we deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus, for who he is, for what he's done, what he's accomplished on our behalf so that we could be made right with you. And God, I thank you not just for who he is and what he's done, but the manner in which he did it, the attitude with which he did it. An attitude of self-denial. Humbly setting aside his position, his power, his desires, his ones to obediently live out your will. God, we need your Holy Spirit to teach us how to do the same. To teach us how every single day, how we can deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Jesus. We love you, Lord. And we pray these things in the mighty name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.